Hi, Grandma here, and I'm reading It's a Jungle Out There by Ron Snell. It's a story of a family who is living in the jungles of Peru um, <clears throat> as missionaries, um, but maybe not the kind of missionaries most of you think about. They are trying to learn the language of one of the Indian tribes so that they can translate the Bible into their language. Uh, Mashaginga is the name of their Indian tribe. Uh, I am going to warn you, I do not speak Mashagingan. I do not speak Spanish. So my pronunciations are sometimes a little off, uh, but I'm doing my best, okay? And I do look them up ahead of time. It's just, sometimes it just doesn't always carry over. We're starting with chapter five today, which has a picture of a cute little furry animal, a cat. And it's called Midnight Matzo and the Menagerie. Although the Mashagingas gave us lots of chances to practice, we didn't have much luck with pets. Sounds like another family I know. Or I suppose you could say our pets didn't have much luck with us, since we always survived and they often didn't. Our sociable river otter with the sleek brown skin and liquid body gave us no end of laughs, swimming and fishing with us in the lake before he drowned all alone in his own little swimming pool. Then we had a squirrel monkey, which nobody liked and he liked us even less. He'd bitten people on the lip and several other places before dying of heat stroke on our front porch. It was his own fault. No one dared get close enough to move him into the shade. No one shed a tear. My own squirrel monkey, Reepicheep, who was about as loving and fun a pet as any boy could have, ended up hanging himself in his own cage. After spending hours hunting insects with me in the jungle, I did shed a tear. Tia Huaka, our funny little dog that we left in the care of the Indians for a couple months, died of snake bite. Some of our pets didn't die as soon as we would have liked. Our boas got tangled around the plumbing behind our toilet in Yarina and had to be forcibly removed. Our giant toucan perched in a mango tree right above the trail to our back door and whanged unsuspecting passersby on the top of the head with his long, sharp beak. The trumpet birds that perched on the peak of our thatched roof trumpeted and hummed along as we sang choruses during evening devotions, then brazenly pecked our legs during the daytime, completely forgetting they had learned what they had learned during the Bible reading. Even with our bad luck, we persisted in always having an exotic animal or two around the house. Since the Mashagingas were always bringing home live animals they had caught, usually they were babies left behind when their mothers were killed by hunters. Nowadays, I think twice about keeping wild animals as pets, but growing up in the jungle, it was about as natural as having a dog or a cat, excepting most of us don't end up eating our dogs and cats. Mashagingas didn't know about endangered species, so they just ate whatever they could kill and tamed whatever they could catch live. Their version of living in harmony with the jungle involved cutting it down to make gardens and hunting any animals or birds within a day's walk or a canoe ride. That included beautiful macaws, exotic monkeys, and wild tapirs. They were all, I must say, delicious. Now, he didn't come out and say that they ate endangered species or that they ate wild animals, but he kind of says that, doesn't he, when he says they were delicious. Mashagingas sometimes went to great pains to keep their unusual pets alive. Often in the early mornings or late afternoons, we would sit by a cook fire and watch women feed the birds. They'd chew up cassava or bananas, squish a gooey ball of it in front of their mouths, and let the birds gobble it from right between their lips. Or they'd sit and breastfeed monkeys, cuddling them in their laps like furry babies. Still in all, the Indians never lost track of the difference between animals and people, and their pets 
often ended up in the pot. Hunting dogs got a special lack of consideration. They had to be kept semi-starved so they'd hunt better. Most village dogs were racks of sores and bones, frequently beaten with sticks and often always tied to a house post with a short vine. Anyway, midnight was our black spider monkey. He was all black with a small head and pointed tufts of hair that stuck out like bushy sideburns in front of his little ears. He had a small body, but his arms, legs, and tails were long and dangly like black octopus arms attached to a ball of black fur. His black eyes, raised eyebrows, and crew-cut hair always made him look like a surprised little old man. The best part of Midnight was his tail. It was about two and a half feet long and bare underneath. He used it even more than his arms and legs. In his cage or in the trees or in our arms, that tail would slither out like a boa constrictor and wrap around a branch or a swing or our necks since he loved to be carried around and hated his cage, trying to get him off us would take two people. One unwrapped his tail and the other held the rest of him while he barked and squirmed and grabbed at things with his long skinny fingers and toes. In the jungle, spider monkeys are a wild bunch. Every once in a while, we'd see a group of 10 or 20 of them eating ripe fruit, new leaves, 50 or 60 feet above us while we were out hunting. Since they usually felt pretty safe, they often didn't take off right away. First, they threatened us by barking, growling, breaking off dead branches to drop on us. Then at the first blast of a shotgun or rifle or the first hit with an arrow, the whole group raced off through the treetops with trapeze leaps and swings, Branches shook and broke, and the jungle was filled with noise. Down below, we ran to keep up, charging pell-mell through the trees and undergrowth. When you're running through the jungle, it's not a bad idea to watch where you're going so you don't run into stickers, trip over vines, and fall into burrows. Unfortunately, when you're following monkeys, you always have to be looking up. And monkey sprints usually ended up with us looking as if we'd been raked, shredded, and beaten. Sometimes it was more fun than we could stand. Unless the monkeys paused out of curiosity or just to catch their breath, it was hopeless. Even the Mashagingas had a hard time shooting a gun or aiming an arrow at flying monkeys while ducking under branches, wiping huge cobwebs off their faces, hesitating to yank thorns out of their bare feet, and slaloming around trees at full speed. If Terry and I were along, they always had to come back and find us wherever we'd gotten lost along the way. Female monkeys carrying babies had a bit of a disadvantage, so it wasn't unusual to kill a mother with a tiny baby clinging tightly to her fur. If the baby survived the fall, it was taken home to be raised as a pet, and that's how we got Midnight. We took Midnight from the village to Yaranakacha at the end of the summer when we went back to school. He spent his days in a big cage, eating bananas and papayas, or going for walks with us, wrapping his long arms and legs and tail clear around us. Any time we let him loose, he caused too much trouble, like swinging from the curtains in our house or eating the neighbor's fruit, so he rarely got any freedom. After just a few months with us, Midnight came to a humiliating end. Okay, what does that mean? It means that uh, he probably died in a way that uh, embarrassed Midnight or embarrassed them. Okay. One night, he escaped from his cage and went in search of a midnight snack, so to speak. About a hundred yards from our house was the center's fruit shed, where fruit was warehoused for the group cafeteria and for sale. 
Dozens of stalks of bananas hung from the rafters and bins of papayas lined the walls. Midnight thought he'd died and gone to heaven when he broke in. In the morning, Midnight wasn't feeling well, nor was the person who managed the fruit shed, but at least he didn't have severe case of diarrhea. Throughout the day, Midnight drained his feast through the bottom of the cage, and by late afternoon, dehydration had done him in. With a quiet little ceremony, we buried Midnight in our backyard under a cross with his name on it. We grieved the loss of our monkey, but marked the spot so we could dig him up later and see what his bones looked like. When we did, he didn't quite finish turning back into dust and the slimy, smelly mess we found kept us out of his grave forever. Matzo was a different story. Now, if you recall, the name of this chapter is Midnight Matzo and the Menagerie. Well, I thought midnight was the time of day. I didn't realize midnight was the name of one of their pets. And a matzo, I thought it was something they ate, but apparently matzo is the name of another one of their pets. Matzo was a whole different story. From the moment I first laid eyes on him, sitting in his seller's lap at the airport, I knew I had to have him. After all, how often do you get the chance to own an ocelot cub? And that's whose picture is in the front. I didn't know if it was a cougar or what it was, but an ocelot. I don't even remember how much I paid for him, but it was probably in the exorbitant range of $20, including his rope leash. Once at our house, of course, he had the run of the place. Unfortunately, that meant a lot of noise at night since he didn't sleep when we did. The good part of it was we didn't have any trouble with rats while he lived with us. Matzo was short for Monsonsori, or Ocelot, in Mashaginga. He had huge golden brown eyes and a matching coat of stiff hair with tawny yellow and black spots in it. His tongue, even at that young age, would put a wood rasp to shame. That means it was very rough. I had never seen a wild ocelot alive in the jungle. They usually hunt at night and spent many hours walking, often on man-made trails. During the day, they stay well hidden in a thick brush or under fallen trees. Their most common contact with the Mashagingas was to eat their chickens, something Matzo knew about even without his parents around to teach him. Mashagingas shot ocelots on sight, both to preserve their flocks and to sell the skins, which were worth a small fortune. When I first got Matzo, his coat looked as if it was worth about two cents. Presumably, his mother would have kept him in better condition, but she wasn't around and I wasn't about to lick him till he shone, so I decided to bathe him. What do you think is going to happen when he tries to bathe an ocelot? There isn't much to compare with the difficulty of bathing a wild cat. Mom agreed to help me, a decision she would regret forever. Matzo was small and inexperienced, but he knew exactly how he felt about bath water and knew just how to express his feelings with his teeth and his claws. By the time we were done with the shampoo and towel, most of Matzo's orange color had washed out. Most of our blood had drained out. Whatever we accomplished wasn't worth it, and we never did it again. Often in the mornings, Matzo woke me up by licking my ear with his rough tongue. I found his bright eyes and playful spirit irresistible, but my ears were nearly ground off in the process. Of course, we had to feed him raw meat. The hope, foolish as it seems now, was to get him so used to the meat we fed him that he would have no inclination to hunt. That hope was dashed the first night he escaped and went cruising. 
Sad to say, our neighborhood was full of exotic meals. We weren't the only family at Yarina with fabulous pets. Just down from us, for example, the Shanks family had a stunning blue and gold macaw that had been in the family for 25 years. What do you think? If ocelots are often killed eating chickens, do you think he might like that macaw to eat? Shanks Macaw knew all the kids' names and voices and could cry, laugh, and yell like the best of them. To its everlasting credit, it never learned to imitate Martha's violin practice, but it pretty much got the rest of the family routines down pat. In fact, it could carry on family arguments all by itself, sitting in their mango tree and reciting all the parts. Squawky the macaw had a special place to sit in front of the house. Sometimes he was kept there by a little chain, and that's how Matso found him while out for his night on the town. In the morning, Squawky had lost his squawk and was basically a pile of blue and gold feathers attached to a chain. Matso and my family were in a heap of big time trouble. In fact, Matso was headed for the chopping block when Uncle Jim, who loved all kinds of animals, saved him. Uncle Jim thought he'd be able to reform Matso. Well, that lasted until Matso discovered and then dismembered the flock of chickens in the backyard of the children's home. Although we had thought it fabulous that he hadn't forgotten how to hunt, his tastes were getting rather expensive. Survival of the fittest sounds like a great principle until the losers are all your neighbor's pets. In the end, Matzo went to a nearby zoo. It was him or us, and there wasn't room for the six of us in the cage they were going to give him. Then there was Sahino, our little white-lipped Picari. Wonder what that is. When we got home, he was a cute bundle of bristles about as fun to cuddle as a wire brush. He was the orphan survivor of a pig hunt and already incredibly agile. So this is a pig, a type of pig. Domesticated piglets are pretty helpless for a long time. Baby Picaris, on the other hand, take off after their mothers within a few hours of being born. So he's telling you there's a difference between domesticated pigs that are like on our farms and pigs that are wild, like uh, the, the animal he's talking about. In the jungle, there isn't much time for lounging around while you're learning to walk. Our first attempts at a pig pen were laughable. He jumped out of boxes, fences, cages. Fortunately, having him out wasn't actually that big a problem since he had pretty well bonded to our family and would never run off. I don't know if it was our smell or our food that made him feel so at home. Whatever, he stuck around the house, he explored around the house, rooted around the house, found our stash of special treats, now remember, when we went out to live with the Mashagengas for several months at a time, we had to take all of our precious supplies with us in small planes like our Aracondas, Arancas, Helios, and Cestas. Our weight allowance was so restrictive that often we poured out extra drinking water before squeezing into the plane. Everything on board was absolutely essential to our survival, we thought, including the can of real butter that would provide special treats over the next several months. On our birthdays, for example, we'd get butter with our crackers and think we were just the luckiest kids in the whole wide world. Our pig didn't know about rationing and we didn't know the pig liked butter. When he started, he probably didn't know he liked butter. Still, there it was, hidden under Dad and Mom's bed with the rest of our goodies in a can that just had a flimsy tinfoil wrapper on it, and no one was looking. Can you guess what happened? Probably. 
By the time someone went into the bedroom, there were butter smears all over the Pona floor. Little shreds of buttered tin foil scattered everywhere, and a butter fat, butter faced pig sticking his tongue out as far as he could to lick the butter off his eyebrows. <sighs> we licked his prickly hide, yelled at him in Mashaginga, and nearly made him throw it all up. When we all fl flew back to Yaranakacha a few days later, we took Sahino with us. There was no place to stash him, so he rode on Mom's lap for a couple of hours, having buttered her up, I don't, don't know if that's intended to be a pun or not, in the days since his glutinous farage. But back in Yarina, Sahino went up the center's experimental farm to live with his more civilized cousins. Dad hoped to breed him with domesticated pigs and produce a hardy, healthy super pig that would weigh 400 pounds, leap tall buildings in a single jump. First, we had to contain him long enough for him to fall in love with a fat sow. Apparently, he wasn't enchanted, and he managed to jump out of everything we put him in. Finally, in desperation, we emptied a 55-gallon barrel that we used to store our belongings when we were going to go away for a while. The barrel was about 26 inches in diameter and 40 inches high. There was no room for Sahina to move, much less get a running start. By morning, he had jumped straight out. Unfortunately, we had to give up before we could introduce high fly bacon to the world with no way to contain him. We ended up doing what any good Mashagingas would have done. We ate him. He had that rich, buttery flavor that you don't often get in the jungle. Where do you think that buttery flavor came from? Do you think you'd been fattened up with the butter? I do. Okay, that's all for today. Our next chapter is called Arturo and Maria. And I think we have a picture of Arturo and Maria. And it's going to be a long read. So, bye-bye.